but but it's interesting. I've noticed in some of these controversies, like uh, for example, in in terms of the great flooding that occurred at the end of the last ice age, there's there's one interpretation that I kind of consider to be the sort of the American interpretation, and it's mostly geologists with the U.S. Geological Survey, and they have a model, right? And this model has been pretty much entrenched since the 1940s and 1950s. The Canadian geologists, of which John Shaw was one, have come up with an alternate model. And this alternate, so, so there, in a way, there's almost this conflict now between American geologists and Canadian geologists. And the Canadian geologists, I'm afraid, are right in this case. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in Canada looking at the evidence up there that, yeah, okay, when you're, when we're talking about the, 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 the glacial meltdown, and the old, the old idea is you would assume that glaciers are melting from their, from their margins receding back, just as exactly as we have seen in the last two centuries with the, with the, um, the, the diminishing size of, of modern glaciers, which are basically little ice age glaciers. And it's important to point out that this little ice age, which was roughly 1400 to 1850, is like the coldest 400 years of the entire Holocene of the last 10 or 11,000 years. It's the coldest. Mm -hmm. And the glaciers during the Little Ice Age grew to their largest extent in, ten, in over 10,000 years since the end of the Great Ice Age. So when we start talking about glacier recession, it's important to realize that while well, our baseline, we're talking about glaciers receding from their Holocene maximum which is bigger than, than they had been in, in literally 11 or 12,000 years. So the idea is, is when we see these glaciers receding over the last century or two, they basically, you can look at, and I have lots of photographs where you see this, you look at them every few decades and the margin of the glaciers are receding backwards. You know, essentially mountain glaciers are receding up valley. Um, but when we go and we look at the melting at the end of the last ice age, you, you know, you have to bear in mind that over half of North America was buried under this massive sheet of ice that was uh, at least as big, probably bigger than that, which now covers the South Pole. And when you start thinking about it, that's pretty phenomenal. You know, if you yeah. go from the Atlantic to the Pacific and from the Northern United States up to the Arctic Circle, and everything is buried under thousands of feet of ice. You know, when we look at cities like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis, Seattle, all of those cities were, of course, those areas were buried under thousands of feet of ice. It's going to make now, it hard to get to work, right? Yes, it would be, uh, <laughs> it would be tricky. <laughs> so here's my point, is that now when we look at the way the glaciers disappeared, we're not really seeing glacial recession I mean, that's part of the process, but we're also seeing these melting events, these epicenters of melting that are sometimes hundreds, even close to a thousand miles up within the glacier mass itself. Right. Um, the, the, the melting back of the ice sheets was as rapid on its northern perimeter as on its southern perimeter. And that makes no sense at all within the conventional explanations of deglaciation and what caused it. Right. Drumlin's going back to that, is the, is the geomorphic form, the form in the landscape that I think is key to deciphering uh, and mapping these melting epicenters. And how would you get a, a, a center of a, a catastrophic melting that, let's say, is, you know, five or six or 700 miles up within the ice mass itself? That doesn't make sense. Right. Conventional models. And so we are definitely looking at something catastrophic. And when we're looking at the melting, um, some of these meltwater floods were just unbelievable in their scale. It just almost it, it very, you know, I, I've spent, you know, thousands of hours out in the field, literally. And, you know, I can go out there and travel, let's say, from Portland over to western Montana, looking at these, this flooding phenomenon where it's very spectacularly preserved and you can spend two weeks out there and you're only just beginning to get the the, the bare perimeter parameters of this event and, and it, because the scale of it is so extraordinary that you know you you, it, you just have a very difficult time wrapping your head around and and it's interesting i think that that what we're looking at here is is essentially a trauma a major trauma in earth history that 
and and we I think it's important in some of the stuff that you're getting into, Sean, is to what extent, you know, when you when you have somebody who basically sees their they've survived an event that has wiped out their entire world, what what is that doing to their consciousness? What is that doing to perpetual generations? Is there <laughs> And this is not something I've had the chance to really explore yet, but is there a, an imprint, a genetic imprint, some memory in our well, DNA so, that uh, sorry, carries we, that trauma with us? We have, right. So this is interesting. I, I, I know a little bit about, too much about this right now. So, I mean, the, we, we, what you just described exists, and we know it exists. It's, it's called uh, ep epigenetics. So we know, we know, yeah, we know areas that, it, um, you know, having gone to war and experienced really uh, ravaged sections of this world, I mean, I've, I've read all these studies, and this is, you know, you look at these areas that have experienced war for the last 100, 200, 500,000 years, and what happens is we, we discovered, we, the, the study of we, um, <laughs> that, you know, they found that there's these epigenetics that are really influenced by our environment, and they found that areas like Syria, um, Afghanistan, or Afghanistan that uh, are just uh, ravaged by war, it, it brings out these genetics, these epigenetics within people that are more sadly and really sadly more suited for war. So you get a higher percentage of sociopaths. You get a higher percentage of psychopaths because that's that's the environment that goes on. It, it is a literal generational trauma. So we, I mean, I, I'm totally on board with your, your view of this, that it is in our DNA. Absolutely. And we know that now. I think the science is just kind of coming out showing, oh, shit, our environment kind of fucks us up a little bit. And it's encoded in us. Yeah, well, you know, the science of uh, genetic memory in mass, I mean, you know, they've shown that if you shock a mouse in an environment that is, uh, you know, striped or whatever it is, and then you can have its grandchildren and great-grandchildren yes. that Thank have you. never been exposed to that same type of trauma put in the same environment that created the triggers for that trauma, and they freak out, yep. even though they were they not... They don't know why. Yeah, and they don't know why, but they were they themselves were not exposed to the trauma in the first place. They were simply the offspring of the of the mouse that had the trauma in the first place, and they have found this in, uh, in tapeworms and things like that, 17 or 18 generations. So we know that the genetics can carry the message down from generation mm -hmm. to generation. And so, I mean, all of this stuff pulls together, because when we're talking about Getting a core sample. <laughs> right, exactly. When we're talking about... We have to go through the mind to do that. Things that humanity have, has experienced generations back, those could be written into our existence right now, right? And so I think, that's, I think that makes this discussion especially poignant because, you know, as much as the, of the multiple disciplines of science that you've pulled together, Randall, to be able to tell this one story about a catastrophic event, which, by the way, I mean, I noticed... Uh, like on the last conversation that you guys had with the, with the talking about the elephant with the or the mammoth with the broken legs and the full tummy of undigested food and stuff like that. When you're talking about a traumatic celestial body coming in at thousands of miles per hour, you know, of course, if it hits a, a big piece of ice, it's going to create create a massive melting and a lot of heat energy, etc. But it's also going to create an immense shock wave, because these guys sitting on the couch can tell you, ordinance goes off. A sh um, the first thing that you feel is the shock wave connected with that through the atmosphere, and so. And then the second thing you feel is the shock wave. Wait, yeah. What? <laughs> and then the third. What? And then the third thing is all the shit in your body <laughs> rattling around. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you got uh, you've got this immense shock wave that could knock animals off their feet and of course kill them instantaneously because there's only a certain amount of compression that the human brain or that any brain can uh, withstand before simply ceasing. Like people have accidentally shot themselves with blanks in the mouth and killed themselves even though nothing was expelled from the weapon the pressure itself created the sinus wave shock wave that basically ended their life uh because of the shock wave itself but then you know like you said uh you were talking about the science of the of the the great climate change heating and then cooling again and then heating again it's like okay this comet comes in destroys the ice caps creates all this flooding but then the heat associated with that is going to warm the earth because of the energy that's ex you know released within the atmosphere itself but then all of this stuff is thrown up into the atmosphere blocking the sun dropping ice water on everybody basically you know for a long period of time it's going to cool off again before then not having the ice 
and mass to adjust the climate of the earth and then we're going to warm up over again over time is that is that accurate that's pretty close um yeah the initial impact literally the environment would have just been rendered chaotic um and and there's you know emerging evidence of uh major global firestorms that came in the wake i mean the the evidence of an impact now is quite robust right. um, and and when it first was proposed by more what i would consider more mainstream scientific community was 2007 i actually came upon the idea from reading uh, ignatius donnelly probably in the mid 1970s who who proposed who who made the commentary connection with um uh, the demise of Atlantis. So it's certainly not an original idea with me, but it was so considered on the fringe that nobody really even paid attention to it. Nobody even looked at it. So as, as the years went by and as I learned more and I realized, well, there's so many things that are going on um, with these global changes that really aren't explained. Maybe we need to reconsider some of these, you know, quote unquote, fringe ideas. Right. And, and as it turns out, the fringe ideas are really more close to the truth than the, the, the mainstream ideas of strict gradualism. Because, you know, most of the 20th century was a rejection of anything, uh, you know, that, that seemed catastrophic at all. And this goes back basically to the early controversies in geology, when the early first geologists were almost all catastrophists. 